Daniel Lakai is uh, chief economist at Tresis Gestion and joins us now. Um, Daniel, you, you would have watched the initial market reaction as we did to those inflation numbers and thought, is, is the market prematurely arguing that we've peaked now on this cycle with these price pressures? How did you read the data? I was quite surprised when I saw the opening. Uh, to think about uh, uh, such a reaction, considering the elevated levels of core inflation and also the very high risk of uh, bad print in the most important element, which is uh, shelter. So I was actually uh, quite surprised to see such a robust opening. But then we saw how the market started to fade throughout the rest of the session as everybody started to digest that uh, rate hikes are not going to be enough to uh, curb the inflation uh, implications particularly on core inflation. That's what worries me the most. What I see is that 98% uh, prices are rising and that uh, the, uh, it, uh, a lot of it is very sticky, is that there is a lot of the day-to-day uh, -day things that, we, that citizens purchase on a daily basis. Those are the ones that worry me the most because if we remember in 2018 and 2019, healthcare, uh, shelter, all of those were already rising and uh, the impact for the average household in America is very important. So give us, um, give us a pathway um, to um, market performance uh, through the next two or three months here. Um, how do you think markets continue to adjust as we get further data confirmation of these price pressures, particularly around food? In my opinion, I think that what we're going to see is a very uh, weak first half of the year. Because if you think about it, the market still needs to come down in terms of earnings estimates. It also needs to revise growth estimates, particularly for China and for the European Union. And all those things added to inflationary pressures and the view that central banks will, at least in the first half of the year, adhere to their promises of rate hikes. All of those generate volatility and weakness in, in markets. I think that once those are embedded in valuations and once the market has adjusted macro and earnings expectations to the new reality of uh, rate hikes, then where we can see some level of Buying. So I think that the opportunity lies fundamentally on U.S. stocks into the uh, second half of 2022 because that's where you still have the positive element of, one, the uh, repurchasing of shares, which is a key factor. Second, the fact that the U.S. economy is relatively shielded from the Ukraine crisis and the uh, the risks of the China slowdown, and third, because it's the one that can adapt uh, more easily to the rate hikes. Dan, good morning to you. It's Karen jumping in. I want to pick up on the point around adjustment to earnings because we were talking about this before through the context of the big U.S. banks and that the capital markets income has been much lower than even some of the, the lower forecast anticipated. What can we expect then as we start to move throughout earnings season at a sector level? Is there anything that's going to be somewhat resilient at this stage? I think that there are two sectors in which expectations are too high. You mentioned financials. I think that that is very evident because both the trading segments and the uh, net income margin is go are going to show a level of weakness that we probably uh, did not expect for a year like 2022 uh, last year. However, the other one that I think can be a negative surprise is the energy conglomerates. Margins are under pressure. We are going to see the cost increases impacting margins. And although, yes, commodities are going up, many of the integrated uh, energy players are going to have very weak uh, second part of the year. 
particular, and the expectations of uh, double-digit, very aggressive margin expansion is probably too optimistic. So I would look at the most cyclical part of the uh, stock market as the most dangerous, because that's where you're going to see margin compression and where you're going to see the impact of the slowdown in credit growth coming from rate hikes. And Dan, can I ask you a little bit more about central banking? Because it feels as though a lot of the doves, even uh, stateside, are now very keen to demonstrate their Volcker-like characteristics. Do you think we could be setting up for some form of a policy mistake, given that uh, we've seen in the past that no central banker wants to be accused of being asleep at the wheel when inflation is unfolding? Is there a concern now that uh, central bankers are going to overreact to price pressures? I think that there is a certainly a risk that central banks rely too heavily on only rate hikes. Because if you think about it, rate hikes may have an impact on the level of credit growth, the level of increased money supply growth. But the key factor to uh, reduce inflation is to reduce repurchases of assets. That is something in which uh, central banks are paying less attention because they have, at the same time, governments with very high levels of deficit. So what I think is a big risk is that central banks rely solely on rate hikes and they do it too aggressively at the beginning that it creates a credit crunch because uh, real rates are already rising and credit growth is already uh, suffering and they don't do anything or at least anything relevant about repurchase of assets, which is, in my opinion, the most important factor in terms of curving inflation. At the end of the day, what central banks need to think about is that what needs to be done is to reduce the amount of money that was injected into the economy in 2020 and 2021, not just the growth of money supply. So I think that uh, there, in this environment, as you very well mentioned, Karen, thing that everybody's going to be worried is that you may have a path of rate hikes that does uh, impact credit growth and the, and the improvement of the economy, yet it does not really do anything about core inflation, which is what everybody's worried about. Daniel, let me ask you a slightly different question. You're an economist, um, not a geopolitical strategist, but we're all having to try and figure out what the impact of the Russia-Ukraine war is on market prices and asset class valuations. There was a story over the weekend about China sending six aircraft loaded with uh, ground to air missiles over the weekend. These, these planes went to Serbia which we know is a Russian ally. It's not getting a whole lot of attention here, but it does beg the question whether China is trying to use different means to supply Russia with um, uh, fresh supplies of, uh, of military equipment. Uh, no confirmation of that at this stage, but interesting that Serbia needs six transport plane loads of surface-to-air missiles at the moment. Um, if we find out that the Chinese are using various methods to resupply President Putin's arsenal. What happens then for markets if the West decides that this has crossed the line? That is the key question, because, Jeff, what happens in the next month is that if we start to see, one, we just saw the Russia trade with China figures, they're up 28% in the first quarter. We saw as well these uh, scattered pieces of news that suggest that there might be a way in which Russia is avoiding sanctions through Chinese trade. If uh, this is confirmed and ends up being a contentious issue with the United States and with the European Union, and obviously what ends up happening is that it generates a further level of tension in the Ukraine crisis, what is very likely to happen is that we go back to the war 
that we saw in 2018-2019, which is the trade war, is that we go back to very aggressive, uh, you know, every type of protectionist measures that will uh, be implemented against China. So the reason why this would be bad for markets is twofold. On the one hand, it is extremely negative for emerging market economies, which in, in the environment of inflationary pressures is obviously an area for looking at for investments and, and kind of leverage to the inflationary pressures. And the other one is because obviously you start to get a much bigger hit on economic growth globally. So we need to pay a lot of attention to what is happening between the US, uh, the European Union and China, because right now the evidence is that sanctions to Russia are sort of being at least moderated by the very strong increase in trade with China. If on top of that, what we see is a confirmation of what you just mentioned, that there might be a sort of tangent way by which China is helping Russia uh, strengthen its military position, then we go back to the trade war and we go back to uh, sanctions. And sanctions to China are much more severe on the global economy than sanctions on Russia. Daniel, always good to see you. Thanks for giving us your time this morning. Uh, Dan Lakai, uh, Chief Economist at Tresis Gestion. Thank you for watching this video. Please subscribe to my channel, like my videos, leave your comments below and keep defending freedom. Thank you very much.